Now, Eyewitness Sports. Welcome to the latest episode of Double OT with Yanni and Mark. He's Mark Dondera. I'm Yanni Karakis. A lot to get to. A lot of Patriots. We're going to do some Red Sox at the end. We begin with the Celtics playing game four with the Cavaliers tonight. And, you know, we assume the Cavs are going to finish off this series. But they get to the Eastern Conference Finals. They get the number one overall pick. They may do some things in free agency. How bright is the Celtics' future? If you can really pinpoint an answer to that question. Well, Yanni, obviously the future is bright. Obviously, it is bright. Um, but is it as bright as people are saying it is? I mean, it's bright. But listen, here's the thing. <laughs> How bright? Here's the thing. Oklahoma City, okay, they had Kevin Durant and Russell Westbrook. And I'm not even talking about James Harden. Sure. Durant and Westbrook. How many titles did they win? Zero. Zero. So what are the chances that the Celtics get a Durant and a Westbrook on the team, both in their prime, both within the same string of years. What are the chances of that? Not great. So, yes, it's great that they have the number one overall pick. It's all they can do. Danny Ainge did a whale of a job. But if you think just because they're in the Eastern Conference Finals and they have the number one overall pick and they have some pieces that they're just on the doorstep of a championship, well, that's incorrect. It's not even close to being right. And there is no guarantee that this team is going to win a title in the future, in the near future especially, and that's what it's all about, winning a title. LeBron James, as we can see, not going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, Golden State's still a juggernaut. They haven't lost in the playoffs. Durant is still there, okay? It's bright because you have the top overall pick. There is talent in the draft. You have some pieces, Jalen Brown. So yeah, it could be worse. And one more thing. Those other teams that you'll be fighting, if, if we're going to talk about five years down the road, there's some other teams that have gotten a head start on this whole like rebuilding thing. Philadelphia, they've been picking in the top five for how many years? Five years in a row? I mean, they have a nice young roster of people could stay healthy, mm -hmm. and they decide to keep people. Minnesota is a good young team. So if those teams can you know, reach their full potential, well, then you're dealing with a whole new set of issues down the road because you're still behind them in terms of an all-out rebuild. It's great that they're in the East Finals while rebuilding, but as far as winning a championship, I mean, it's not around the corner in my mind. It's not at least definitely around the corner. Right. I agree with most of what you just said. The future is bright. It's not like blindingly bright, not like when you wake up and the sun's like blinding you as you sit there in your bed. A lot of promising things. Eastern Conference Finals, number one pick, maybe Gordon Hayward in free agency, but none of those things and or players the Celtics have right now are transformative players. If you look back at all the NBA champions over the last 20 years, generally speaking, other than like the 04 Pistons, you need a top five player in the league to win a championship, whether that's Tim Duncan or LeBron James or Kobe Bryant, Paul Pierce for the Celtics in 08. So I like and they had Kevin the thing about the Celtics is that they're in like they're in like two mini windows. They're in this Al Horford, Isaiah Thomas window. But is that going to coexist with the Markel Fultz? We presume they pick him and Jalen Brown window. And Absolutely Avery not. Bradley's in there. I think we all agree they're not going to get past the Cavaliers as they are constituted now with LeBron James. So do you kind of ride out this window and bank on the Markel Fultz? Jalen Brown, Avery Bradley window with maybe the tail end of Gordon Hayward's career. The thing about the NBA, it's so tough. You either have to bottom out and start over or be at the top and compete every year, which I think they'll do. I think as a Celtic fan, it's great because they're going to be one of the top four teams in the East every year. But like you said, are they truly a title contender? It's almost fool's gold being this close to the end right now, being you know three wins away from the NBA Finals because they're a country mile away from that, not just three wins away. So... The future is bright in terms of a perennial contender. You know, who's who in the West is good every year, like uh, probably with Harden, like Houston or OKC for all those years. But they never – all right, OKC was a title contender. But just one of those teams that you know is going to be in the playoffs, but they don't really threat the, the Golden States and the Cleveland. Why don't you do this for me? Before you worry about the Cavs and the Warriors mm – -hmm. Why don't you try to stack up to the Spurs? Because in my mind, San Antonio is just one rung down from Cleveland and from Golden State. So why don't we figure out if the Celtics can, can beat the Spurs in a series, can win one game against the Spurs. Greg Popovich, Kawhi Leonard, LaMarcus Aldridge, those guys. I don't know if Tony Parker and Manny Ginobili will still be around. But can they beat that team? Because if Probably you can't not. beat that team, you ain't touching the can other ones. Can you make the argument the Celtics are the fourth best team in the NBA right now? They're better than Houston? Probably be close. Fourth or fifth? You could make the argument. 
But they're ascending, You right? can make the argument. Yeah. But again, this isn't about being in the top. Which is great. Yeah. But think about all the teams. Like, the Colts were really good all those years with yeah. Andrew Luck getting close, but they never beat the Pats. Nope. Were they really title contenders? No, nope. it's not about being in the top, whatever. It's about winning the championship, yeah. especially in Boston, Massachusetts. And it's so hard in the NBA because, generally speaking, the best teams win. It's not NFL where you can have a fluky 2007 Giants team or 11 Giants team who go 9-7. No, and there's seven no flukies the super, in the Bowl. NBA. <laughs> Uh, okay. In the NFL, as you just mentioned, there are flukies. And coming up, well, uh, I would think a motivated Rob Gronkowski based on certain things that have transpired. The question right here, though, Rob Gronkowski gets a contract extension. What does that mean for the Patriots? What does that mean for Gronk? And what did you think of the new deal? Not, a ex uh, not an extension to be clear, but a restructuring. restructuring. Uh, so basically, it's all incentive laden. So if he plays 90% of the snaps next year, catches 80 balls, 1,200 yards, he makes twice as much as he would have. I think this is fantastic for the Patriots, and it's fantastic for Gronk. We all know the knock on Gronk. He can't stay out there. He can't stay healthy. He only played eight games last year, I think 13 the year before. He's missed several postseason runs, including that 2011 Super Bowl when he was hobbled with the ankle. So, Gronk, you're the best tight end in the league. We want to pay you like the best, which you'll be if you reach all those incentives. Just stay on the field. Uh, I think it makes him happy. It appeases him a little bit. We know he's a little salty about his contract. He's tweeted about it you know it must be nice or something to the effect I'll keep grinding so I think it makes Gronk happy the Patriots are willing to pay him as the best tight end in the league as long as he stays on the field and I think it bodes well for his future in New England because with all the injury stuff I think we all agree that maybe Gronk doesn't end his career in New England with the uh, injury concerns so I think this bodes well and you know Hopefully, I don't. Here's the thing, Mark. I don't know how he plays differently. Is he going to say, "Oh shoot, I need 80 catches or need to be on the field 90% of the time"? Am I not going to run this route over the middle as someone tries to take my knees out? Um, well, <clears throat> excuse me. My answer to that would be maybe this is the Patriots um, sending some kind of a message to the whole Gronk injury culture, and by that I mean his family. Maybe they were a little bit. I mean it. it I shouldn't say maybe because it appears in the past they've played it safe. They've been cautious with Gronk. Correct. Whether it's coming back, whether it's whatever, uh, rehabbing from injury, play it safe. And I don't blame them, but maybe this is – and we know the Patriots wanted him on the field. There was that whole dispute whether or not – Right. Um, the joint press yeah, release. Yeah, the joint press conference. Was it the father calling the shots? Was it the belly? So, like – Maybe that's the answer to that I question. I like that perspective. I hadn't thought about it. That um, it's forcing the Gronk's hand. If your kid wants to get paid, you got to put him out there. You got to, and you have to, you know, essentially beat Tom Brady. Decide that you're not going to be injured. You know, you get a bad, you, your back goes da bad, you get a bump, a bruise here. Doesn't matter. You're going to find a way to stay on the field. That's what I think the Patriots want the mentality to be for Rob Gronkowski. And I think this restructuring endorses that. The headline, though, uh, regarding the the new, the new deal, to me was they seem committed to him. They seem like, hey, we want it to work out. I wouldn't have been surprised if Bill was kind of you know one foot out the door in this whole thing with Rob and his injury history and the stuff that they you know the the past production that he's had, but also how many games he's missed, how many back surgeries. We know that he gets rid of guys sooner rather than right. later too early rather than too late. I figured that this might have been um, right. but around how, the around the 16th, Gronk, 17th hole. He came out in hole. 2010. What is he? 27? 27 around there. So he's still young. But We've seen tight ends perform. Tony Gonzalez played late in his career. Yeah, Shannon but, Sharp. Yeah, but they were, I mean, Tony Gonzalez was as smooth as yeah. they come. Gronk, uh, very kamikaze-like. Um, Three more years on his deal. But though, it said, this deal says to me that Gronk, we want you around. We want you to contribute. We want you to still be a centerpiece to what we're doing here. You just got to stay on the field. If you can stay on the field, number right. one, we'll be happy because you know, you'll know you want to be on the field, which then I don't think they're thinking that he doesn't want to be on the field. Right. But it'll also say, hey, you know, I'm here and I'm present, and that's good for the team, that's good for the offense, and it'll make it easier for them to commit longer term than if he's not on the field. So this is maybe like a, a last hurrah to, hey, Rob, we need you to prove to us that you can be healthy and get through a full season and produce and be consistent, and we'll go from there. The latest uh, move from the Patriots in an eventful offseason, I think, uh, we'll be seeing them on Thursday. We'll get into that in just a bit. Someone who also doesn't like to, be, to come off the field, Tom Brady. 
Giselle Bunchen always getting Tom in trouble <laughs> on CBS uh, this morning saying Tom's had many or specifically one concussion last year. He was she was kind of wishy washy. Uh, but the big question is the NFL's denying that he had a concussion. The Patriots are. Um, did Brady cover up the fact that he had one? Do you think he had concussion like symptoms but was didn't want to lose his job so didn't say anything? Yes. Yes, Easy, I mean, simple. Yes, he obviously there was at some point some hit that produced some sort of concussion symptom. Um, do I blame him for not doing that? No. Um, would I advise him to to ignore concussion sy symptoms? No. But I understand why he would do it. You don't want to go down that rabbit hole. You don't want to. It just creates kind of a mess as far as the protocol and being available and being able to practice and prepare the way you want and taking you out of your routine. And then, like we said, Jimmy Garoppolo being in the mix and having him kind of waiting in the wings and right. giving him another shot. You don't want to give anybody any excuses. So yeah, I, I totally. And even without Jimmy Garoppolo, I understand these guys want to play. Um, I, could I go back and pinpoint a hit? That, that knocked Tom Brady, you know, that be, rung his bell? I don't, right. I don't know, yeah. maybe. Um, but, yeah, I would say, yes, he covered up some kind of concussion symptom throughout the course of the season. What NFL player didn't? Right. You know, you said, can you pinpoint one hit? I don't remember a single hit where you're like, oh, gee. Like, Julian Edelman getting hit over the middle in Super Bowl forty nine, oh. concussed oh, yeah. 100%. Brady, I agree with you, probably had a concussion or symptoms throughout the season. Do you remember early on in the season, maybe the first half, they kept pushing his media availability back from Wednesday to Friday. I don't remember what the ailment they said it was. He wouldn't practice. Maybe that was it. And they were, um, you know what I think it is? I think he was feeling the symptoms. He probably told a coach or two, maybe Bill, and said, hey, feeling a little lightheaded. I wouldn't mind sitting this one out. And they said, all right, sit out, and uh, we'll save you for the game. I don't think it was one of those things where they put him in harm's way. If he was stumbling all over the field and couldn't remain upright, I don't think they'd keep him up there. But at the end of the day, being part of the concussion protocol, the player has to be willing to allow himself to be evaluated fairly and ultimately decided on if he has a concussion. So how did Tom Brady earn his job back in 2001 with Drew Bledsoe getting hit? So he gets out, Garoppolo runs off 8-9, you know, you never know, and Brady's always said he takes pride in being out there every game, and he never wants to get off the field because he knows what can happen to you. So, football players get concussions; it just happens. Yes, it's an unnatural movement. I mean, Troy Aikman. I mean, a quarterback like that. How many did he say he had? But listen, Tom Brady. I mean, Giselle has a right to be worried. You don't. Of you don't want your husband, who's you know, almost forty years old, to be you know, a potato in five years. Right. Um, and she said it during that interview that they want to be a hundred years old right. and frolicking about doing fun things. So and, I mean, I don't. I don't buy into any of his like. Uh, I drink this water that helps me concussions. Avoid no. Concussion. I no. Mean, that stuff's a little. That's witch doctory. <laughs> Good. Um, okay, next. Patriots start OTAs on Thursday, as you alluded to. What is the big storyline? This is the first time they'll be on the field together since the Super Bowl victory. What is your big storyline that you'll be looking towards? Isn't it going to be great seeing people in uniforms playing football? Sure will. Oh, it's going to be great. My biggest uh, thing I'm looking forward to is all the new players getting acclimated. You know, are they split? You know. How much are we going to see in terms of formation? You can't really hit in OTAs, so it's almost like a flag football practice. I want to see Brandon Cooks. I want to see him with my own eyes. How fast is this guy? I want to see how Stephon Gilmore is placed in relation to Malcolm Butler. How are they going to work out the cornerback situation? Uh, I want to see Dwayne Allen at tight end. Big fella. Is he going to go over and, and make some catches? Uh, so many new players, the rookies included, how they are integrated within uh, the Patriots early on because there are times in recent past where you'll see someone out there in OTAs in a starting role and they're like, since when's this guy a starter? I was reading someone today. I think it was Mark Daniels. Like last year, David Andrews as a rookie was the starting center at OTAs and we're like, this guy was drafted a month ago. Like, wow, they're high on him. So just integrating all the new guys. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, Last year we were all Brady versus Garoppolo. How many snaps? Because we knew the deflate the suspension. suspension. Yeah. Um, sure, the new guys, that's the answer that the, kind of the easy answer, I guess. I, I'm excited for that. I can't wait to see those guys kind of mesh. And, mm -hmm. you know, remember, this is unlike any offseason really we've seen. So you're going to have a lot of star power walking out onto that field. Um, the wide receiver repetitions will be interesting. Um, right. But. 
Yeah, I, I mean, my biggest thing, I guess, is you know who I'm really interested to hear from and to see? Cyrus Jones. Yeah. He had some, you know, he flashed at Alabama. I mean, he was a second round pick. Had flashes at Alabama that this guy could be able to play and was really awful in his first year. I want to see how he performs and I want to see how he sounds. Does he sound confident? Does mm. he sound ready? Does he appear, you know, poised to. to live up to any kind of potential that he may have in the National Football League because they could use it, number one, um, as, as a depth piece. You can never have too much depth at corner. And that would be a, a tough pick to waste if he ends right. up a nothing. You know, So I can't wait to see how he settles into year two. And we heard over the offseason, he, what did he say? He was embarrassed. He had all those fumbles as a punt returner. Yeah, he was, he uh, called it a year from, an awful year, year from hell, whatever he said. I can't he was wait dog to see house. It. Oh, he right. was doghouse. I can't wait to see how he responds, That's a good one. how he sounds, and ultimately, will he be at all in, in line to contribute? And I don't expect to see Gronk at all until maybe, you know, coming off the back surgery until training camp maybe. Will Tom Brady talk with the flake gate last year? I don't think he talked till late August. Is he now going to be one of the guys again? Or he's, he doesn't want to have to answer the concussion questions on Thursday. Well, whenever he talks, he will have to answer those questions. Right. Um, will he talk Thursday? Maybe can, not Thursday. Can we, just, can we just ever just have a Patriot practice week, month, year without any outside noise? Is no, it possible? because they are so high. From Aaron Hernandez to Tim Tebow to Deflategate to Spygate, it's never ending. They are the standard in the most popular league in the world. They are... Led by a Bill Belichick head coach who is, you know, ornery with the media, maybe the greatest of all time, gets under people's skin. Tom Brady, we talked about this, great looking, mm -hmm. ultra successful, wife is a big name. You people oh, yeah. want to, everything that, you know, every move they make is under the microscope. People want to see them fail. There's a large contingent of them out there. So, yeah, you look for, you poke and prod and look for anything you can. So, yeah. Here we go. All right, NFL, uh, some changes to this upcoming season. Uh, overtime, now just 10 minutes instead of 15. Hopefully no more ties. Uh, celebrations, they're getting more lenient on that. Something Roger Goodell was strict on for many years. NFL was for the no fun league, but now you can, I guess, quickly do some orchestrated celebrations. You can use the football. Nothing. You can't twerk, apparently. Uh, so we ask, your favorite NFL celebrations over the years? Well, the one that... Um the one that, I guess, put me on the map, if that makes any sense, the first celebration that really I noticed. You remember Irving Fryer? Yeah. Okay. He used to Long wiggle his ago. legs. <laughs> I used to love that guy's wiggle. Like, he used to just shake his legs. I, I, he that was did a good one. He's great. That was the first one I remember. Usually any uh, celebration that, that mimics a basketball when they dunk it on the goalpost. Dunk's big, okay. The, I was like, like the fan. turnaround jumper, they, I think. No, I don't bad. like that. The dunk is impressive. I mean, you can jump that high with all those pads on. That's pretty impressive. Um, and, that, yeah, that's pretty much – I mean, those are the ones I look for. I was never big I, – I mean, I wasn't a celebration guru. I used yeah. to enjoy Terrell Owens. Well, you know, when you play yeah, – Terrell Owens. Yeah, he, anything he did. I, when he signed uh, the football, I, I thought liked, that was unbelievable. Uh, this is Chad Ochocinco. He wore the NFL Hall of yeah. Famer, question mark. A um, couple I have. The Dirty Bird. The Dirty 98 Bird Falcons. Yes, I love that one. Uh, Terrell Davis, the mile high. I didn't like you didn't that. Like one. that? I mean, it was fine. My number one, and it's not really a celebration, is just Deion Sanders doing his dance. Oh yeah, just beautiful. the prime time. The prime, the prime time. time. I mean, he was high stepping at the twenty. By the time he was in the end zone, he was at like the tail end of his dance. Um, the Lambo leap's cool. That's a good, it's a nice tradition. I like, you know, I like the football. You turn it and you, it's hot. Do a little. Sure, sure. Uh, the Gronk spike is great. I mean, the traditional way to celebrate spike the, the spike. football, but it's highly anticipated. Uh, what are some other good ones? Terrell, what did Terrell Owens do? Well, he went to the Star in Dallas that, that time. Was bold. He signed the football. You that remember, was good. I'll tell you who I like signing the football. Underrated. That was remember Joe Horn brought out the cell yeah. phone that time? Joe Horn cell phone. That, this is when they got good, and then yeah. the NFL was like, no more. Yeah. And uh, Joe Horn's cell phone was good. That was a great one. What were the other ones? It's usually it's usually wide receivers doing it. Well, they're in the end zone probably more. I like uh, Ladanian Tomlinson's little yep, flick. Yep. It's a good one. Creative. And my favorite as a Patriot fan growing up, Tom Brady rushing touchdown. The spike and then the let's go. He okay. had one in Dallas two years ago that I think is the image of him on the new Madden. Okay. 
Anytime Brady runs for a first down into a touchdown, that's all my in. favorite. Yeah. Uh, all right, that concludes our NFL segment. All right, lastly, uh, let's go to the Red Sox. We've kind of been struggling with Red Sox topics, struggling. even though they've been struggling. I don't know, it's early dog days. Uh, John Farrell, an incident, got into a Drew Pomerantz. They underwhelmed in Oakland, hovering around 500. Is he on the hot seat? What's your take on Farrell's current situation? Listen, you're at 500 right now. Not ideal. You're better than that. As we stand now, he's not on the hot seat. If they lose eight of the next ten and they become six games under 500, I think he's gone. Dave Dombrowski seems like a guy who's willing to pull the trigger early and often. If you didn't want to ride with John Farrell, though, this season, you should have gotten rid of him in the offseason and hired Tori Lovello, who is a very capable bench manager who had a above 500 win the previous year when Farrell, unfortunately, was dealing with his cancer treatment and was out. So... If you weren't going to get Lavello in the offseason, then I feel like you have to kind of ride Farrell through the season. Who are they going to go with? Gary DeSarcino used to coach the Paw Sox. He's on the, that's a name you hear floated out. But I don't know if Farrell – listen, I think everyone agrees he's not the in-game manager. He's not, that's not at the top of his list. If he loses the clubhouse, Mark, I think you got to get rid of him. But if, he's, if they're just toying around with 500, I don't think canning him makes you that much better. So currently as we speak, I say he is not on the hot seat. What do you think? Is he on the hot seat? No, I don't think he's on the hot seat. I think he should be on the hot seat. Ken Rosenthal um, reported that had they got swept by the A's, he could have gotten canned on Monday. Wow. Okay. Um, here's the thing. You know what this is feeling like to me a little bit? I feel like this resembles the Bruins and their handling of Claude Julian. When Jeremy Jacobs came out afterwards and admitted that, yeah, you know, we probably waited a little too long with Claude. I feel like we could have that press conference eventually with the Red Sox. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, we probably rode with John a little too long. That's the way it feels to me. Um, I'll say this about the Red Sox. Hovering around 500, this team is better than that. They should be better than that. This next stretch, they have six games, including the one they're playing on Tuesday night at Fenway. Six straight. Then they go on the road. Three or four in New York, and then three or four in Baltimore. I forget which way it shakes out. That is a pivotal stretch. Sure. Because you're behind those two teams right now in the standings. I think they're four and a half out. If they end up after this homestand, say six out, and then you go into that stretch and stink. Yeah. Well, then uh, you might be talking about having, losing the season. I mean, if you get down 10 games, how are you making that 10 up? games, he's gone. Even 7 or 8, I think he's gone. So, they could, I mean, if he's not on the hot seat, he could get there fast, and he could get beyond the hot seat. He could get too hot They won, I think, fast. 93 games last year. For them to win 93 right now, they'd have to play uh, like a 690 clip or something, which, I mean, if they get hot. David Price should be coming back. I don't know what he's going to bring you. We need the offense to heat up. Yeah. I mean, I mean pri listen, whatever Price is going to bring you, it's not going to be enough to overcome the offense in the way it's no. been. They have, I mean, you see their home run totals? Some guy the other day for the A's, Chris Davis, some no name I don't even, I never even heard of, he hit a home run. They're like, oh, it's Davis' 13th of the year. 13? <laughs> no, people have I think that many home runs. They're last in home runs in, in the American League. They League. were at one point. I mean, Jackie Bradley Jr., what is he at? I mean, Mookie Betts He's, finally heated up a little bit. He has like seven. Well, a lot of these guys that are your good hitters, Betts and Bogarts and Jackie Bradley Jr. are supposed to be your good hitters, aren't putting up the power but, numbers. J Bogarts ben has Tendi got, zero Ben Intendi was hot briefly, come back to life. And then while you think Hanley's a big swinging, swinger, what do you have, 20 home runs last year? You're not going to get the 35 home run that David Ortiz is going to give you. Bogarts has zero home runs. I mean, how he hasn't hit one this year. Not one. How are you supposed to work with I mean, with Moreland that? is like your thumper right and now. And he's come back to life. So it's just they need more. They're not getting it. The David Ortiz loss is huge. Hanley Ramirez has been what we feared, injury prone and underwhelming from a numbers perspective. And that's what we were worried about after the big year he had last year, hitting behind Big Poppy. Uh, quick name drop. I saw Poppy at the Seas the other day walking with his son. His son's enormous. He's going to be hit? Next Poppy. I don't know. Is we need old? him. We need him. I mean, okay. I miss Poppy. You miss Poppy? I mean, yeah, I miss Poppy. You I missed? loved his. I just loved his at bats, his swings. Yeah, I mean, is, I miss, is there a can't miss at bat right now for the Red Sox? Well, I just miss his production. I mean, he was excellent even at forty. If you're if you're making dinner for your wife and she's like, so and so's up. Is there anyone that's going to make you stop making dinner and go into the living room? I never did that even with Poppy. Griffey Jr. Well, yeah, I was Griffey amazing. was up, and you were across the street. I'd run home to see his. Okay, up. yeah. Well, that was different, um, but. 
That, that's what I think a sales start is. If sales pitching, I'm going to watch. Yeah, he, you need to. You like seeing him, uh, but this team just isn't. Something's not right. Something's not right, and the record will prove. You know, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll, what's the Bill Parcells quote? You, you are, are what your record says. The are. record will tell you what they are. The thing is, and the if they have nowhere else to look, and they don't know what's wrong, you look to John. I mean, that's where you go first. So, uh, the good thing is with the two American League wild cards, you're always kind of in it. Kind it's of. It's hard to like bail that. Early. Right, you're kind of in it. All right, that'll do it for the latest episode of Double OT. Anything you want to add? No, I'm good. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, catch it online, WPRI.com. On iTunes. Please, catch it online. <laughs> Click on it. Page views. And check out our Twitter feeds, at Mark Dondero, at Yanni Krakis, and we'll see you next time.